The title of my message this morning is The Gospel of Grace Has Always Been Plan A. The Gospel of Grace Has Always Been Plan A. God has one plan, <laughs> and, 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 and Plan A works, right? He's only got Plan A because Plan A works. This is what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, a Christless sermon is a brook without water, a cloud without rain, a well which mocks the traveler, a sky without a sun, a night without a star. Oh, Christian, we must have Christ. We must have Christ. The gospel is the good news about the message and the person and the power of grace. And grace is not a doctrine. Grace is a person, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Grace is not a person. Grace is not a, it's not a doctrine. It's a person. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This is what this person did. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a revolutionary statement. And it's something that we need to declare over our lives every single day. We need to grow in understanding that we are the righteousness of God. We are as righteous as Jesus is right now. That's why we, we are able to come to the throne room of grace, to receive grace and mercy in a time of need. Because Jesus, God sees us as worthy. Amen. Amen. You know, Revelations chapter 13, verse 8, this scripture really blows my mind. It reads as such, the Lamb of God which was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God which was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. Dare I say, dare I say that the cross was a mere formality. Jesus, you know, I watched the Passion of the Christ the other day and, and, and just familiarizing or, or trying to get a picture of what the cross meant, what the cross meant for Jesus. But here the word of God is clear. It says, the Lamb of God that was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? That means before the creation week, before God spoke, let there be, Jesus had already died. The Lamb of God that was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. The reality is this, the blood of Jesus was shed for us before the creation of the world, but was only revealed to us when Jesus was crucified on the cross, died and rose again. Not even Satan knew about the redemptive shed blood until then. This truth, once understood, should have great implications for our faith, which means God had decided before the beginning of time that I'm going to love them even if they don't love me. I'm going to bless them even if they don't deserve it. I'm going to be faithful to them even if they don't deserve it. He had decided it before the beginning of time because he knew he was going to create me and you. People of free will. He didn't create robots. He created people who, who, who needed to choose him. But he needed to settle it in his heart first that I'm going to choose them even if they don't choose me. Isn't that good news? That's good news. That it was settled in the Father heart of God before he even created us. And that should further prove how much of a free will we've got. It's, it's as if the blood of Jesus, you know, God took out an insurance policy before. It's as if to say God had taken out an insurance policy before creating mankind. It is a fully comprehensive insurance that pays for all damages no matter what. And even promises to restore back to new. That insurance is the blood of Jesus. The main strength of the insurance, just like any normal insurance policy, is that it was taken out before the incident. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. It was taken out before the incident. That is why it covers everything. Jesus' death on the cross was not an afterthought by God. Rushed through after the event of mankind falling into sin. No, it had been settled before. It had been settled before. Amen. 
God had to cut covenant with himself. God cut covenant with himself. He needed to settle it. He, need to, he needed it settled in his heart. And as, as we've seen, when God cuts covenant in the word, you know, he always keeps his end of the bargain, right? Man always drops the ball, right? So he needed to cut covenant with himself. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 6, 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. He swore by himself. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it says, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. It's impossible for God to lie. Pastor Ray says this many times. If God walked into the room and said, my shirt was green, it would turn, or rather my shirt is red, it would turn red because it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Let us be encouraged by this. That the same, God is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. The same God who settled it in his heart before the foundation of the world is still the same God who is still choosing you whether you deserve it or not. Unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. This is revolutionary stuff. This, this should impact your life like, like, like nothing else here on earth. This is what absolutely revolutionized my life, the unconditional love of God. Because trust you me, I know where I've been. I know where I've been. And when I encountered this unearned, unmerited, undeserved, I was like, this is the best deal in the world. You can't help but take the deal. Just take the deal. Take the deal. And we're going to give some of you an opportunity today to take the deal. It's a good deal. It's a good deal. I heard someone say the other day, you know, if God wants all the glory, let him do all the work. Praise God. God had to cut covenant with himself. He had to settle it in himself. And, and God doesn't change. He does not change. And, and you know, young people, and by young, I mean if you are under the age of 80, identify yourself with that which does not change. Identify yourself with that which does not change. Because we can see everything is changing. The rand is up, the rand is down. Cut, purple is the new green, yellow is the new black. Everything is always changing. But God doesn't change. You'll still be standing 30 years from now because you've identified yourself with that which does not change because everything is subject to change. My parental status is subject to change. My marital status is subject to change. My financial status is subject to change. Everything is subject to change. But one thing that does not change is that I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And identify yourself with that which does not change. Amen. You know, the gospel of grace, like I said in, the, in, in my title, is plan A. It's always been about the gospel of grace. It's always been about the gospel. The gospel was not an afterthought that we're reading about in the New Testament and in the epistles. It's always been part of plan A. It's always been God's MO, so to speak. You look at the life of Abraham. Abraham dropped the ball spectacularly. Spectacularly dropped the ball. But God's grace was sufficient. Nehemiah, Nehemiah built the, 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 the temple with burnt stones. I mean, allegorically, if you think about it, those burnt stones are me and you. We are those burnt stones. But God still chooses to build the temple using us, showing again. The grace of God has always been part of plan A. You look at the doorpost. I mean, the, 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 the blood on the doorpost of the, of, of the nation of Israel blows me away because who was behind the door? Ah, who was behind the door? People who didn't deserve it. People who weren't part of the nation of Israel. People who, who most probably were catching on nonsense inside behind the door.
inside behind the door. But when, when the angel of death flew over, what did it see? The blood, the blood, the blood. All Jesus, all God sees today is the blood. That's all he sees. He doesn't see your performance or lack of performance. He doesn't see how much you give. He doesn't see how much you tithe. He doesn't see how much you serve. He sees the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. I don't have to perform. I don't have to earn it. I'm loved. And that's what empowers me to give. That's what empowers me to serve. That's what empowers me to preach the gospel. Because I'm loved. I'm loved unconditionally. Unconditionally. Isn't that powerful? You are loved unconditionally because God settled it in his heart before the foundation of the world. I mean, you look at the picture of Hosea, God instructing Hosea to marry a, a, a prostitute. It shows that it was a, it, it, God, through, God through the, uh, um, Hosea's marriage to Goma was a symbol that illustrated his endurance of an adulterous bride. Here we are today as the church. Do we love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and everything that we have? Let me ask that question. Who in here loves God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul? Just put your hand up. You're all lying. <laughs> Liars. I'm married. I've got two kids. I'm running a business. I'm involved in the ministry. I'm an endurance athlete. There's so many things that occupy my mind. And then factor the fact that we, deal, we only use 10% of our brains. And with that 10% of our brains, you want to be a husband, a wife, a minister of the gospel, a businessman, all of those things. And then try, understand this multidimensional, multifaceted, awesome, superior being with 10% of your brain. It's impossible. You can, you can endeavor to, but <laughs> you will never hit the mark. We all fall short. We all fall short, but he still loves us nonetheless. Amen. He loves us even when we are unfaithful. He chooses us even if we don't choose him. Amen. Now it's time to take the focus off yourself. Take the focus off you. But we all with unveiled face, beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image daily. All we have to do is behold. That's why, you know, when I walked into here and, you know, when you hear a worship team just lift up the name of the Lord, all, all we are as ministers of the gospel is if you've ever been to an art gallery, all we do is we just stand aside and show people the masterpiece. Just stand aside and just say, just look, marvel, look at the cross. Look at how beautiful Jesus is. Look at what he done. Look at, look at what he did. Look, look at the, the, the precious blood. Look at the cross. That's all we do. Show the masterpiece. And all we have to do is behold the masterpiece. And that's what changes our lives. Take the focus of yourself. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 8 in the message says, those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never, never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Isn't that beautiful? Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what God is doing. Take the focus off yourself because we become by beholding. And I guess the reverse can happen. I've just thought about it for the first time. If you're continually beholding yourself, all you'll ever become is yourself. Right? All you'll become is just yourself, consumed with yourself. I say this with so much love. Get over yourself. 
If you think you have messed up God's plan for you, get over yourself. You're not that powerful. You're not that powerful. Amen. I'm preaching good better than you guys are saying amen. Amen. If you think you've messed up God's plan for you, you haven't. You're not that powerful. He is the author and finisher of our faith. What he starts, he brings to completion. Amen. What he starts, he brings to completion. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. It says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. If you are justified by your own good works, if you are always obsessed with yourself, you can't partake of, of, of God's riches at Christ's expense. You, you can't partake of it. You are fallen from grace. And I, and I remember, I used to think, you know, and, and, and I guess it's, it's, it's quite prevalent in, in, in the lexicon when you hear of a rock star fallen from grace. You know, rock star fallen from grace. Usually it means they're not selling as many records, right? But fallen from grace means you, you, you can't partake of, of, of the unmerited, unearned, un, uh, unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of God. If, it, if it's dependent on your own works program, you are fallen from grace. And, th- and think about this way. Grace is a higher standard of living. Partaking of the unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor of God is a higher standard of living. Anything less than that is, is, is second class. Take advantage of God's grace. Take advantage of his love. In those areas where you are failing spectacularly, say, come to him boldly into the throne room of grace and receive help in a time of need. In those areas where you're falling short. Amen. I don't want to live a life where Christ has become of no effect. I don't want to live a life where Christ has become of no effect. Because he's not going to compete with us, right? Right? It's either he, we rest in the finished work of the cross and he works. Or we work and then he goes, okay, sweet. These guys are justified by their own moral muscle. Be my guest. Be my guest. And you know what? No love lost. Be my guest. Let's see how that turns out. Hmm? Christ has become of no effect. Please, let's not live lives where Christ has become of no effect. Let's fully take advantage of the cross of Calvary and what it means, right? Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I think it's in Ephesians chapter 1. It talks about, uh, uh, I pray that you grow in the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that we may know him more. That should be, that should be our, our mission, to know God more, to know the power of his resurrection, to know what, 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 what it meant to, to, to hang on that cross, that should, be, that should be our life's mission, to understand this precious gift of salvation, right? And as I'm sure you guys know, salvation is not us just going to heaven one day. It's experiencing heaven here on earth, prospering in all aspects of our lives. Beloved, I pray that you prosper and are in health even as your soul prospers because it shows that God is interested with success in every single area of our lives. Every single area of our lives. I want to be successful in every single area of my life because that's what Jesus died for me to have. So whilst we're still here, let's figure out our own salvation and attain it. Attain it because the earth is groaning for the sons and the daughters of God to be revealed. The the, the world is waiting to see people prospering in every single area of their lives to show that God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. The the, The earth is groaning, waiting for me and you. As signs and wonders, we are called signs and wonders. And what does a sign and a wonder do? It points. It points in a particular direction. So stop justifying yourself by your own works. You can pull out a long list of deeds. You know, my mom goes to a traditional AME church. My mom got born again when I was preaching once at Rema, thank God. And, you know, she, the old traditional religious setup, as all of you know, is is a proper works program, right? And and, And then they also go to church for four hours, which is another story for another day. 
They sing this song called Lehodimo la Sebelezwa. Lehodimo la Sebelezwa. And they sing it for an hour strong. And Lehodimo la Sebelezwa means you have to work for heaven. Isn't that heartbreaking? It's heartbreaking. My mom is, is it, like, b- before she, she got born again, w- would be tirelessly working, making sure that she's at the church and there's so many events and so many things going on because she felt she needed to earn the love of God. And I'm like, no, mom, it's paid for. And then we serve from that place. We don't serve to get to that place. We serve from that place. <clears throat> we serve from that place. Heaven is a free gift. Heaven is a free gift. No one earns heaven. No one deserves heaven. I mean, even, even going to hell. <laughs> People don't go to hell for sin. People go to hell for rejecting the finished work of the cross. Because the sin issue has been dealt with. Jesus Christ leveled the playing field. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. He has forgotten our lawless deeds. He dealt with sin once and for all. So no one can be punished for sin. God's righteous anger has been quenched on the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. It's quenched. It's done. He is sitting down, chilling. So, 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 you, you, you experience eternal damnation by not receiving this free gift of salvation because you think you can do it on your own. You think you, do it, you can do it on your own. God is not good to us because we are good. God is good to us because he's a good God. He's a good God. I'm trying to look for the time here. Is that me? 9, 9.41, down. <laughs> Even going to hell is not enough to pay for the debt of sin. It's not enough. There is only one sacrifice that was enough, and that was on the cross of Calvary. And that was on the cross of Calvary. And, and you know what? You always have to put this disclaimer, unfortunately. I'm not advocating for lawless, lawlessness. Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. You sleep with somebody's wife, the cops are coming. <laughs> you, 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 you submit an irregular tender document, the cops are coming. You take money out of the offering bucket, the cops are coming. But God's unconditional love does not change towards you. Sin has consequences, right? Sin has consequences. Hmm? I want to ask this question, how much is enough if you're going to be justified by your own works? How much is enough? Do we have a barometer that measures that goes, okay, fine, now I've done enough. How much is enough? How how much tithing is enough? How much serving is enough? How much much singing in the worship team is enough? How much praying is enough? Is Is there a standard? Can you share with me what the standard is? There is no standard. There is only, the the, the sacrifice of Christ Jesus was enough. Jesus is enough. Amen. He came to fulfill the law. You know, I always tell students whenever I minister at campuses, I'm like, it's as if Jesus, you know, went to, uh, um, you know, uh, Rao, or, you know, well, they don't call it Rao anymore. UJ. I'm giving away my age, Right? It's as if Jesus went to Rao, wrote the exam, or rather went to UJ, wrote the exam, got a, got, a, got a summa cum laude PhD. He passed with flying colors. And then he walked out into the courtroom, called all the students. You know, all of us, he called us. He says, because I have passed, you have passed. Pass one, pass all. Because of one man, death reigned. Now because of one man, life reigns. Pass one, pass all. But some of you still want to go into the exam room and write the exam. Some of you still want to go, because it's like, it's too good to be true. 
I, 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 I want to go write the exam myself. No, 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 no. Pass one, pass all. If there's anything you learn from me today, it's pass one, pass all. Pass one, pass all. Jesus has gone to the cross, but some of us are living like he hasn't gone to the cross. Satan knows your name but, and calls you by your sin, but Jesus knows your sin but still calls you by your name. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, if you look at the requirements before the cross of Calvary, Deuteronomy 28, the first two words are telling, if you, if you, all about your performance, if you do said things, you will get said things. That's, that's, that's the requirements before the cross. The requirements after the cross, Galatians chapter 3, the first word is telling, Christ. Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. And it will continue to be about Jesus. And you know what? He is coming back. He's coming back. The most important thing happening on the face of the earth right now is not COVID-19. It's not, it's not the local elections. The most important thing happening right now is the advancing and the advancement of the kingdom of God. That's the most important thing happening right now as we speak. It's not front and center, you know, on the news. It's not something that you get to see every single day, but it is happening. And the kingdom of God, it's coming. It's coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen. Grace isn't a small prayer we say before meals. It's a way to live. It's a way to live. It's a way to live. You know, Muhammad Ali's uh, tombstone reads, you know, the good deeds you do on here, here on earth are the rent you pay to make it to heaven. I mean, how many good deeds earn you to get to heaven? How many? Remember I said there's, there's no standard. There is no standard. I remember I saw, I want to close with this. I saw a man of God do this. I want to just drive this point home. No, not 50 bucks. 100. 100. Someone, come here. Just one. Stand there. Castigo. How are you? Are you good? It's a hundred bucks. This is my friend Garth. Where was he sitting before he came here? He was sitting right there. What has he done to earn this hundred rand? It's not a trick question. What has he done to earn this hundred rand? What has he done? What's that? What has he done to earn this? Excuse me? He had, he did nothing. You see, there you go, justified by your own works. I walked there. No, 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 no. He did nothing to earn this. He did nothing to earn this. That's, that's God's love and unconditional, unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. It's unearned. And all he has to do is take it. Take it. Take your healing. Take your prosperity. Take your righteousness. Take it. It's been paid for. Just take it. You did nothing to earn it. Thanks, Castigo. You did nothing to earn it. What do you need from God? School fees, a husband, healing, strength, wisdom. What do you need? Just take it. It's been paid for. It's been paid for. The thing is, we're bringing in our, our world conditioning that says, if you, when you do this, you get that. This is the kingdom of God. Does not work like that. It does not work like that. You can't do anything to earn it. Let's get that in, let's get that in our heads. We can't do anything to earn it. It's unearned. It's unmerited. Undeserved. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Can you bow your heads if you're in this place today? 
If you're watching right now and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm not talking about how much scripture you know. I want to lead you in the eternal prayer of salvation. The Bible is so clear. In order for what Jesus did for us by dying at the cross, shedding His blood, by being raised again from death, from the grave into everlasting life, He did that for us so that if we would believe upon that work, if we would believe that He died for us and He rose again for us, we would be saved for eternity, forgiven for eternity, washed clean of all our sin for eternity. I'm not asking you about tradition. If you've ever been in a church or this is the first time you've heard of Jesus, how much scripture you do or don't know, I'm asking you, have you ever consciously shifted from the natural to the eternal and declared Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? The scripture today told us that therefore I believe and I speak. The prayer of salvation says, I believe in my heart Christ died for me and I speak it. So I wanna lead you in speaking as you believe in your heart, speaking out the prayer for salvation and Jesus in scripture and by the power of God says, you will be saved. You're not here by mistake, you're here by divine appointment today. Pray with us. Repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, shedding your blood. Thank you, Jesus. All my sin, past, present and future was washed away. And when you rose again, you secured my eternal salvation. Today I declare, you are my Lord. You are my saviour. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer, we wanna celebrate with you. Those of you watching right now, on the screen is all the information how you can let us know and we can reach out and serve you and pray with you and celebrate with you today. Do you know the Bible says, if one person repents to believe in Christ, all of heaven celebrates. And today we know that heaven is cheering you on so we wanna give a big hand to every single person that prayed that prayer for the first time today. Welcome to the family of God. We're gonna receive communion together right now if we can. Just take out your communion elements. Those of you that are watching right now, you can get communion at home and just grab some bread and some juice. Those of you in the room, take out your communion elements. You're welcome to remain seated or stand, whatever's more comfortable for you. But this is all about not looking around, but looking up. Not looking at circumstance, but looking at what Christ has done for us. Who are we in Him? And the Bible teaches us that this bread is His body. Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. And the Bible tells us that by His stripes, we are healed. All sickness we bring to the cross today of Jesus Christ. And as we break this bread, we declare we are healed in Jesus' name, healed of sickness, healed of disease. We receive and we partake of healing today in Jesus' name. This juice, the blood of Jesus. Jesus said, this is my blood shed for you. His blood was shed so that we could be righteous cleansed of every sin, past, present, and future. Sometimes people will say to me, but pastor, how do I know my, my mistakes that I might make in the future are covered by the blood of Jesus? And I always answer them, when Jesus died, how many of your sins were in the future? All of them. Today, every sin has been paid for in full. The eternal perspective of you today is you are righteous, perfect, pleasing, and whole. Receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. I pray that today's word blessed and touched you. Let us know if you experienced something, if something happened on the inside. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to hear the testimony of how God used us to impact you. Until we see you again, stay safe, be blessed, and know that grace is greater than any obstacle you face. From us at Redemption Church, have an incredible day.